because it seems also that these social aspects of dreaming, our interactions and perception of other dream characters, it's a very abundant feature of dreams that on the average, every dream, in every dream, there is two to three other characters. So we very rarely actually dream about being alone. Yeah. And, and therefore I've suggested that actually dreaming, I mean, one of the functions of dreaming is to be, to, to simulate uh, the social world. Following is my conversation with Professor Antti Revonshaw. Antti is a Finnish neuroscientist slash philosopher. He has published amazing work. One of that is this book that I love, Foundations of Consciousness. Highly, highly recommended. Auntie is one of those philosophers who has his own lab. So he is very practical minded. He approaches consciousness from a biological mechanism and framework and a multi-layered architecture, drawing a lot of parallels from studying life and how over time uh, we were able to demystify many processes that make up a living cell. Auntie also looks at consciousness from the point of view of studying dreams and how we have a pure state of consciousness or a more isolated state of consciousness in a dream state. And to him, uh, everything is a dream. This wakeful state that we are all in, you know, during the course of the day, that is a continuation of the dream state as well. And that is a very, I have found that to be a very useful way to uh, think about and study consciousness. Auntie is real, his perspectives are unique. Uh, he aims at uh, demystifying uh, all uh, that is out there regarding consciousness and he uh, is a big believer in the scientific method. Uh, I learned a lot from this conversation. I know that you are going to have a lot of fun as well. Uh, I uh, collected a lot of questions from uh, Auntie's, Auntie's fan following and I was lucky to ask him uh, most all of those questions. So you're gonna have a lot of fun. And now here is my conversation with none other than Professor Antti Revonshore. Antti, sir, how are you? I'm very, very fine and, and very enthusiastic to talk about consciousness and dreaming and, and, and all these kinds of mysteries of the mind. And with, hopefully, with you uh, hopefully, Antti, you will, over the course of uh, this conversation, you will, for our audience, uh, demystify that. Uh, a lot as well. So I, as I was just sharing with you, a huge fan of you and your work. Uh, hopefully you will write in time another book. Uh, and I'm sure that you'll talk about your uh, research and teaching, but let's, let's get into it. Uh, tell us, Auntie, that from your perspective, uh, from a practical perspective, what is consciousness and start unpacking it, sir, uh, uh, for you and and our audience, one person is saying, and this person is a pretty senior person. He's saying, well, he loves your. Uh, he probably have seen you in your other lectures and stuff. So he loves your professorial style of building up step by step and people to understand. So we are in a good company with that, Auntie Sir. Over to you. Okay. So, what is consciousness? Well, I mean, the core of consciousness is really subjective experience or what, what we call phenomenal consciousness so that it basically feels like something to exist so that, that we, we feel our own existence. I mean, that's really the core of consciousness, but it comes 
to us, I mean, consciousness shows itself in the form of an entire world. I mean, a sensory perceptual world that, that we experience that we are in the center, we are immersed inside the center of an experiential world. And, and, and uh, this is what our conscious life pretty much consists of. And, and what makes it uh, a challenge for science to explain is that consciousness feels like something. And now this is, this is the question that how do we explain something that has these subjective and qualitative feelings? Because this is something that is lacking from scientific descriptions of, of uh, I mean, what's going on in the brain, neurophysiologically, neuroanatomically, neurobiologically i mean i mean how do you how do you generate the feeling that you exist inside this kind of a wonderful world how do you squeeze it out from neural activities that's that's the the challenge for science no that is so very true uh, so this term qualia uh, can you maybe auntie talk a little bit more about uh, how do you uh, see qualia and uh, and what is the modern thinking in terms of how to uh, approach qualia? Uh, okay, so yeah, yeah. So qualia that that is a rather philosophical term that that philosophers have used to describe exactly this this feature of consciousness that to have conscious experiences feels like something and there are many different qualities of experience that, that we have. I mean, just if you think about visual, visual perception and visual experiences, uh, we, we have different color experiences and somehow it's the brain that actually generates those color experiences. They are not out there in the electromagnetic radiation, although we kind of misleadingly often call those like red wavelengths and blue and yellow and green wavelengths but actually of course they don't have this experiences that that we have in our color qualia experience and and what we know about those uh, qualities i mean i mean we do know that there are brain mechanisms that seem to be necessary to to create them for us so we know that there are uh, particular localized brain injuries for example that can wipe out the experience of color and, and the person with that kind of uh, damage to the brain sees the world entirely in in shades of gray although that person had a normal color vision before and there is nothing wrong with with the eyes i mean i mean the color sensory perception in the eyes is is is, is i mean totally okay so it's something in the brain that really generates these qualitative aspects of subjective conscious experience and 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 the challenge is to explain well how does the brain do it we know it seems to do it some in some way but but the mechanism is is uh, is a mystery is there auntie currently what is the most uh, current thinking on the how the the mechanism of uh, why we feel, uh, why does it feel something to, you know, have the state of joy or pain? Pain is certainly very personal. Uh, I, I have some uh, friends, unfortunately, who uh, lost their uh, limbs due to some unfortunate events in their life. And that is kind of how I got interested into neuroscience uh, when I did not have any knowledge of things neuroscience-wise at all, uh, even as a student, when I learned that they are experiencing phantom pain or pain, not phantom pain, pain in phantom limbs, limbs that no longer exist, but the pain that they experience is so real and there is no real cure for it. And to me, that was just like, fascinating to just learn and then as I started that journey you know and read you know uh, people like uh, Professor Andy Clark and Carl Friston uh, I learned that perception is a construction 
in, in brain. So brain is doing this predictive coding, this predictive construction. Uh, it's not, we are not some kind of a passive, you know, mirror on which sensory stimuli come in and we just see it the way it is. It comes in, but then there is all this construction uh, going on. Uh, so maybe you tell us a little bit about uh, how perceptions become, uh, how this phenomenon of perception happens. It looks like there is a lot of literature on this predictive coding, uh, predictive coding uh, business. Would love to hear from you, uh, uh, you on that. And then I think the question then becomes that, okay, as you say in many of your lectures, self is not separate from experience. We experience many things. One of that is the selfhood thing. So it's not as if you make this very distinctive point compared to some of our, you know, colleagues like, you know, Anil Seth, who wrote this wonderful book, uh, Being You. So he talks about there is an experiencer who is experiencing stuff. So experiencer is separate from the contents of experience. And what I find very resonating and fascinating in listening to you is, no, there is no experiencer in terms of it is, it is just part of the experience. So in this context of, uh, and Anil Seth is a world-renowned uh, neuroscientist and you know his book is being read by a lot of people too. So I would like you to talk about this whole business of predictive coding and uh, the, the experience and there is no separate experiencer from experience. It's all part of the same story. Okay, so well, well, to be honest, I, I haven't used really the framework of predictive coding in my own own work, but but I know that it is a hugely hugely popular approach, not only to explain consciousness, but in general to explain uh, kind of like perception and and perception action loops. And and now yeah. I'm not entirely convinced how specific predictive coding framework is for explaining consciousness because it can be applied to explain I mean many different aspects of perception and action and representation in general so so I'm I'm still like like uh, kind of uh, unsure about yeah. can it really provide a specific explanation for consciousness or is it a more like like general uh, framework in which we can put explanations of many kinds of phenomena and it doesn't necessarily make a distinction between unconscious processing of information and conscious processing of information but when it uh, when it comes to what i mean what do we know and what what we don't know about the the mechanisms of consciousness so first of all there is this term called neural correlates of consciousness so that means that when we run experiments and we try to design them so that we make the the subjects experience a certain well quality let's say a color experience a pain experience any kind of subjective experience and and then in the control condition we keep everything the same except that there is no experience at I mean, this is difficult to do experimentally, but, but there are certain things we can do. For example, to show the same stimulus to the subject, and in one condition they can see it, in another condition they, they can't see anything of the stimulus to keep everything constant. And then we look, I mean, we measure brain activity with, with some, or, or maybe ideally many different uh, 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 functional brain imaging methods or EEG, and then we compare. And what we can see the difference is, I mean, we call it the neural correlates of, of consciousness. And of course, we, can we have found out a lot about these neural correlates of consciousness. And, and I myself have been studying visual, uh, neural correlates of visual consciousness mostly. And, and in general, these visual and other perceptual correlates, they seem to be largely happening in, in the posterior parts of, of the cortex. And there is a, a model that, that calls, that is called the, the posterior hot zone 
theory of the neural correlates that that has been put forward by by for example uh, Christoph Koch and 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 Julia Tononi based on on a lot of uh, empirical evidence that it is the most of the posterior parts of the brain that that uh, uh, somehow generate these this perceptual world basically like like the visual qualities and so so that's what we know that there are neural activities uh, that correlate with the experiences that we have in consciousness and another thing that we can say that we know pretty certainly or at least most neuroscientists take this like for granted as a background assumption is that that these neural activities and brain activities they are absolutely necessary for there to to be conscious experiences that that you can't have conscious experiences somehow floating around without those brain activities and yeah. you can't even have like two different conscious experiences i mean you can't have the experience of let's say red and and blue or or pain and pleasure without there being a corresponding change in the brain activity so that every single different quality that we can have in consciousness must be anchored to a different brain activity that that uh, the differences in consciousness are always mapped into some differences in brain activities although we don't know exactly the, the nature of all these differences at, at this point but the what we don't know then is that even if we can see that there are these correlates that can be let's say like 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 in in, in many cases uh let's say high frequency eeg activities that that are are often like coherent synchronized high frequency eeg activities in 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 the uh, the, the relevant parts of the cortex. What we don't know and what we don't understand is how does this objective neurophysiological activity, how is it being somehow transformed into these subjective qualities of experience? I mean, yeah. you can describe, you can fully describe what is, a, let's say, a gamma band activity in a neural population and if it is somehow communicating with another population and there is some kind of synchronicity or coherence you can describe it from the neurophysiological perspective but now the 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 real problem is how do we build how do we build then the mechanism that somehow translates this all this objective neural activity into the subjective experiences so that we would have a sort of a gapless explanation that 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 look that here you have the neural activities and then you go through these steps and then you have the subjective experience coming out of that that's something we don't know yet and this is called the explanatory gap in yeah. in the neurosciences and and in philosophy so so I, I would say that that's what we do know is that the brain does it and there are specific correlates and and it wouldn't happen without those brain activities, but how exactly it happens, that's still the mystery yeah. of the expansory gap. No, and I uh, and I am with you that uh, uh, I, in this journey, Auntie also started studying the likes of David Chalmers and uh, Daniel Dennett. And I am more in the David Chalmers camp where uh, I do still see, I, I as in uh, somebody who is experiencing uh, myself, uh, hopefully, uh, uh, I do see that uh, there is an explanatory gap that even after all the functions and behaviors are explained, there is still, as you know, Chalmers eloquently puts it, there is still a gap left on that. Why is it that all that processing, all that function, uh, is accompanied by? A sense of experience. So I'm with you totally on that. And it looks like that you also, Auntie, if I heard you correctly, that you also see that there is an explanatory gap compared to uh, uh, renowned philosophers like Daniel Dennett and his position that no, there is no you know, explanatory gap. It is just that we are not able to think properly 
Uh, I think you, it seems to be you are in that other camp where you do see that there is an explanatory gap today. Oh yes, definitely. And, and uh, yeah, I, I find Dennett's philosophy very interesting. And I was, I was studying it at, at some point to try to understand what his position is. And I can see that, that there, I mean, there are other people currently following still in his path. And now it is, they have started to call this theory of, of consciousness illusionism. Which, illusionism, which that is the word. Yeah, so, so the idea, I mean, it used to be called eliminative eliminative materialism but now it's called illusionism and, it is and called the idea yeah, there, illusionism, yeah yeah so the idea there is that we are mistaken in in thinking that that there are i mean that there is this phenomenal consciousness with all these wonderful qualitative features and and that somehow this is an illusion but but uh, i i find it kind of circulatory the, it the, is the logic there because I mean you can't have illusions if you are already not conscious. So, so, so in a way they are trying to yeah trying to prove that consciousness is, is an illusion. But but to use the concept of illusion, you already need to have this qualitative uh, subjective perception. So so I don't think that can be made to work. And and yeah, I mean I in that sense I I agree with like Chalmers and and these people who take phenomenal consciousness and qualia seriously but i also differ from from chalmers in in the sense that that he doesn't he's not very optimistic about the possibility of neuroscience yeah. to ever really explain consciousness so i've always been i mean i have called my you. own approach i have called my own approach biological realism which biological means realism is a term that you use and i'm with you auntie that I also am in the neuroscience camp. I think it is uh, only a matter of time when we would know these things uh, in a much more better fashion. So I am a biological realist, sir, <laughs> okay. as, as, you, as you put yourself. I would, uh, I don't know, have you heard about uh, Joshua Bach? He is a, a computer scientist here in the US. Uh, I don't know if the name resonates with you uh, or not. So his thing is, so he's very popular in the software engineering computer science circle. So he speaks at uh, computer science uh, uh, conferences. Uh, he's originally from Germany, uh, cognitive scientist by training. And his thing is, uh, uh, and I'll do a, uh, hopefully a decent job explaining his thesis. So he is a physicalist, but then on top of that, he is a computational functionalist as well. That's how he describes himself. And then his thing is, brain is creating a story. In that story, we exist. And in that story, there are colors and sounds and pains and experiences. And his thesis is that at the fundamental physical layer, matter, no matter how you arrange it, no matter how it is organized, cannot feel anything, can't have any perception of qualia, can't see any, can't see any, any, any red or blue, can't feel the pain of that it took tooth pain or some other pain, pain feels very real. So he's saying, well, you know, it, it is running on a physical substrate, but then brain has created some parallel alternate virtual reality in that reality, we exist and experiences exist. Uh, and he's not a neuroscientist. So this is just like, you know, uh, uh, maybe a little bit of a philosophical take from, uh, from his side. Uh, but in the only reason I mentioned that is uh, because he, you know, many people listen to him as well. So he has a little fan following, cultish fan following as well. So can, in contrast to that, what do you think? So, so his thing is, yeah, you know, uh, you can try to uh, arrange matter whichever way you want to arrange it. The matter will never feel anything. And the way the brain does it, it, it does some kind of, a, a, it, it writes its own story. And only in that story, it all feels 
very real. He used the term really real and, you know, and, and that kind of a thing. So a lot of American terminal, American sort of, you know, a nomenclature there. So in contrast to that, what do you feel once we would understand the, the biological mechanisms, the neuroscience mechanisms, uh, would, would we be able to, Auntie, is your hope that we would say, be able to say these neurotransmitters or modulators or these chemicals and these circuits and, you know, and all this stuff, when you put it like that, it results in an experience and it's not a correlation, it is a causation thing. You can, re if you can reproduce all of that in a lab, then that thing that you have uh, reproduced is also going to uh, feel an experience. So which camp, where where do you see in the next 10 years or so or 20 years uh, convergence or some results happening? Yeah, I mean that that is a familiar argument actually also from from philosophy, this argument that that it's just simply impossible to rearrange matter or or brain activities or anything physical in such a way that we could explain. Uh, the, how, how uh, consciousness somehow emerges from from there. I mean, I mean, for example, the philosopher Galen Strawson has also put forward exactly this kind of argument, which which is that he he says that this kind of radical emergence is impossible because uh, because by rearranging physical matter, you can't create a new metaphysical category. So basically, this assumes then that consciousness is in a different metaphysical category than, than ordinary physical matter. And I, I think this is pretty much analogous to, to, in the history of science, to arguments that so-called vitalists had against explaining life, or I mean living organisms in terms of physical matter, because then it seemed totally unimaginable how dead bits and pieces of physical matter could somehow gain these magical properties of, of growth and self-replication and multiplication and autonomous movement. I mean, they were completely magical features when we didn't know what kind of mechanisms yeah. are behind them. And they believe that you need to add a, a certain kind of a living spirit into the yeah. dead matter to have these properties. And of course, now we know that they are not two metaphysical different categories. I mean, sure. dead matter and living or living organisms, they are constituted by the same kind of matter. Yeah. And, and that was simply an argument from ignorance. And the ignorance had to do with the hugely complex levels of organization that physical matter can enter into between, let's say just like, like piles of dead molecules and then complex multicellular or even just unicellular organisms that, that there are so many different levels of organization in between that people were totally unaware of because there were no methods. I mean, if you had a poor light microscope, you could only see very, yeah. very little detail in living organisms. I mean, even just figuring out that, that they are composed of cells i mean the cell theory was already a great like like uh, uh, improvement but but now my attitude is is therefore to this not to jump into metaphysical conclusions because of our ignorance and and yeah. my bet is that i mean what we can be certain of is that we actually understand very little about how the brain works yeah. and what kind of levels of organization there are between like basic neurophysiological phenomena and, and, and high level mental and cognitive information processing. And, and somewhere there, we also have a consciousness. And now, now, I mean, it just may be that although now it appears to us that we are dealing with two different metaphysical categories like like brain activities and then conscious phenomenology and qualia but 
it might just be the case that when we figure out like loads of different levels of organization that actually when we study these higher levels of brain organization, we realize that, hey, they start to resemble more and more the world that we actually experience. Yeah. So that the emergence, of course, doesn't happen by us looking at some single neurons firing action potentials. I mean, of course, we can't see any consciousness there. Yeah. But if it turns out that we find some higher level of maybe bioelectrical organization and we see that hey there there is this kind of like like a spatio-temporal organization that actually corresponds pretty closely to what that person is experiencing that there seems to be like this sort of yeah like a virtual reality going on there's the stream of information that is being channeled through this through this mechanism that that resembles the patterns of of qualities i mean spatio temporally and 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 the dynamics correspond so we we start to find like isomorphisms between brain activities and and re- between the conscious world that a person experiences at that point it, it would become much more credible to say that now we actually have found that level of organization where where consciousness is being generated and and we already can at least we, we should be able at that point to directly measure or image or or somehow visualize objectively what another person is experiencing and i think at that point it would become much less plausible to claim that that we can never you know in a sense never find an explanation of consciousness uh, in the brain so so i'm i'm betting on 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 neuroscience in that sense that we really need to find these higher levels of organization in the brain and then we we need to look for isomorphisms so that we we get these isomorphisms between the spatial and temporal dynamics of brain activities and consciousness and 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 then then we i mean if we can never find those kinds of things then we are maybe in troubles but but that's that's still a long way to go there that we could even say that we already know everything about the brain but we never found anything resembling consciousness there when we are when we get there then i would be ready to re reconsider my position yeah. but now i'm yeah. betting that we will find such levels of organization via via like like going to to these higher levels of brain organization uh, uh, with, with neuroscience I think this is probably a good point auntie to come to your main work about you have a very unique perspective of dreams you know uh why we dream how we dream and 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 in i think if in my sort of you know humble research you're the only one who approach uh how to study consciousness or how to ask some good questions from the perspective of dreaming so let's let's go there okay yeah and then dreaming actually was the phenomenon that originally made me aware of of the mystery of consciousness because i started to i mean already before any academic studies i started to wonder about some of my own dreams which were like like these what we would call maybe pre lucid dreams or false awakenings i mean you wake up in your bed and then you start go around your business and then you wake up again and you are again in your bed and then you start to wonder so where was i just before because you didn't actually wake up you had a dream about waking up yeah. and the world looked more or less normal and you believed that you are already awake and 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 these sorts of things and and weird dream experiences made me wonder so what was that world where i was when i had only experienced a false awakening and not a real awakening because that world looked pretty much similar almost identical to the world where i then really woke up and 
and and from those experiences i, I always had uh the interest of connecting theories of consciousness with with theories of of the fundamental nature of dreaming and and i have been arguing that actually we are not dealing with two different phenomena two different mechanisms in the brain but rather we are dealing with the same mechanism which i have also called a world stimulation mechanism or or also some kind of like virtual reality mechanism in the brain and that during waking consciousness this same mechanism has all the sensory channels open and therefore there is uh, kind of like a basic model of a, of a self immersed in a world and this model is being modulated by sensory information so that it actually corresponds to the to the actual physical surroundings so that that you can navigate in your environment and not bump into physical objects and during dreaming the sensory channels are shut down and the dreaming consciousness generates an other uh, conscious self in the world experience. And it takes, takes the, the materials partly from memory, but also it's very like creative because our dreams are not memories. I mean, we don't replay the experiences that we had the day before, but, but uh, recombine and create new kinds of experiences as well most of the time. And then we experience, we are, when we are in a dream, we experience also this being in the world experience. We, we are there personally. We, it's a first person perspective game, so to speak. You, we are usually like in, we feel that we are in our own bodies or in some kind of a body. And, and, and we have this centralized perspective. And we can navigate in that world and interact with that world. And there are other dream characters in that world as well. So it's in many ways, it's highly similar to the world that we experience during waking consciousness. Although there are some, some uh, differences as well, like that we don't have access to self, full self-awareness. So we, we are not oriented in time and place. I mean, we don't know how we ended up in the dream and we don't ask about it i mean we don't ask questions how did i end up here what is this place really and what day is it what am i going to do what did i just do before we don't remember that we went to sleep or any of that stuff we are totally immersed in the present moment within uh, the dream experiences but the mechanism that generates that world of experience in dreaming is the same mechanism that generates the world of experience during wakefulness so we could characterize and this is also what, what some other uh, neuroscientists for example Rudolfo Linas has said that actually waking life is a dream that is guided by our senses our sensory information but in essence in its fundamental nature the sense the, the qualities we experience the space we experience the body as we experience it, they are the same. They are the same as what we experience during dreaming. So it's a guided, physically, externally guided dream, more or less. And, and, and then real dreaming is then an internally, totally internally generated consciousness. So, so, so they are the same mechanism. And now we, we can try to then learn about consciousness by studying dreaming and one thing that that i think it's 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 highly important about dreaming is to notice that it's kind of a pure consciousness in the sense that that it isolates consciousness from sensory and motor interactions with the physical world and it shows us that somehow the brain alone i mean in this isolated state from sensory motor external information it can still generate a highly complex and highly like plausible and and, and richly phenomenological world uh, that that looks like like a real spatially extended 
temporarily progressing world where, where we have all kinds of experiences. I mean, basically all kinds of experiences we can have during wakefulness, we can also have sometimes uh, during dreaming. So this already gets rid of many mistaken theories of consciousness, which try to argue that somehow consciousness is generated by our physical interactions with the physical world. I mean, there are such theories that say that, that we need to be embodied in the real physical body and the real physical body needs to interact with the real physical world and that generates consciousness. But dreaming shows us that the body is paralyzed in a paralyzed state during REM sleep and, and the sensory systems don't generate information that would enter consciousness at, in that state. So what we experience has nothing necessarily to do with what is in the sensory world outside our bodies at that point. So it shows us that, gen, that consciousness really is internally generated by the brain and, and the brain doesn't really need the external world to, to generate consciousness, that, that a minimal contrast between a totally non-conscious brain and a fully conscious brain is only the contrast between totally dreamless sleep and a vivid dreaming sleep. And the brain can somehow do this magic of creating a whole world of experience from its own internal activities. It doesn't, in that sense, need anything external uh, to, 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 to generate consciousness. And that's why to explain consciousness, we also need to look at, okay, so what is the difference? What happens in the brain between this state of, I mean, a healthy, normal brain in a dreamless sleep versus a, the same brain in dreaming sleep? And that's, that's the crucial difference between consciousness existing and consciousness not existing at all. So yeah, I think no. dreaming is really, really crucial. A crucial, I have called it a model system. Yeah. A model system for consciousness research that we can learn a lot about both the kind of philosophical and metaphysical conditions of consciousness, but also, also about like the empirically, the, the neural correlates of consciousness when we run these kinds of experiments that contrast contrast uh, dream experiences with with no experiences going on in, in, in the brain. No, you know, uh, dreaming equals pure consciousness. Powerful, powerful thing. A few yeah. follow-up questions that I was going to ask you. So certainly in the dreams, the dream characters, as you call them, that we, that we see, and we are ourselves one such character, all other characters, you know, in, in my dreams to me, they all seem very conscious and, and, and some of them, you know, are no longer alive, but I, in my dream states, I feel their, the strength of their consciousness of those other characters lot strongly than I ever felt their conscious states when I was actually physically with them and that kind of a thing. Uh, so the question is, is the brain doing some kind of a theory of mind that I see, well, they, you know, that they seem conscious beings too, or because we are in this pure consciousness state, then all these uh, characters, they all seem uh, very real, very conscious. The other thing, just from a personal experience that I want to share with you is, in my sleep dream state, uh, I, my own selfhood uh, is there, but it is not as strong or as profound as I am feeling it right now in this sort of, you know, altered dream state modulated by the external world. In my dream state, sometimes the other dream characters, they come across as a lot more conscious than I am in my dream as a character. And uh, my sense of selfhood in my own dreams is much more mellow and toned down 
and that kind of a thing. So I just wanted to, again, you know, those are, these are just my personal, uh, personal recollections and experiences, but would like to hear from you on uh, the consciousness of other dream characters. Uh, what are maybe your own dreams like, and you are a dream scientist, and what do you hear from or find from the other, uh, other research? So over to you, sir. Yeah, I mean, they, they, it's, it's really fascinating that, I mean, we dream, when we dream, we are really alone because, I mean, we cannot invite any other, we cannot invite a friend to join us and come and see what our dreams are like. And yet yeah. we are not alone in our dreams. I mean, there are these other dream characters. So obviously our brain is capable of simulating other human beings and other living creatures. And these simulations are autonomous from our like 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 the, the the self or the character that is our own self because we do not feel that we can control the other dream characters yeah they seem very uh, autonomous yes yeah they have autonomous behaviors um, much of the time at least and and that's that's a fascinating feature of dreaming and i've been recently also theorizing about this uh, because because it seems also that these social aspects of dreaming, our interactions and perception of other dream characters, it's a very abundant feature of dreams that on the average, every dream, in every dream, there is two to three other characters. So we very rarely actually dream about being alone. Yeah. And, and therefore I've suggested that actually dreaming, I mean, one of the functions of dreaming is to be, to, to simulate uh, the social world. And, and social interactions. And that's why the dream characters need to be autonomous because we need to be able to interact them like, like we interact with other people in, in the waking world so that we cannot know what they are about to do or about to say, and they are not under our control. So if we are going to simulate social interactions, the simulations also have to be independent of our own like voluntary behaviors and our own will so we can't be able to control them by our own will and uh, and yeah so so are they independently conscious well that, that that would be that would require a rather wild metaphysically wild uh, a yeah. theory of consciousness if we claim yeah. that they are independently yeah. conscious but there are some some really fascinating um studies that have been done uh, by by using lucid dreamers so lucid dreaming is the state where you can remember your like 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 uh, for example a task that you decided to do in your dreams and when you become lucid you understand okay this is a dream and i had a task to carry out here and there are a few studies where lucid dreamers were given the task of going to the dream characters and asking them questions like interviewing them or, or giving them yeah. sort of test questions. And, and the results showed that, I mean, they were like, like questions, I mean, simple mathematical tasks or word association tasks. So like simple psychological tests or intelligence tests or something like that. And, and uh, the lucid dreamers reported that when they asked the dream characters to do some simple addition or subtraction, or when they ask them, so what comes to your mind from, from this word? I mean, they gave a word and asked them to associate it with some other word, that they had absolutely no idea what is going to be the, the reply, the answer that the dream yeah. character is going to give. And sometimes they gave very surprising uh, answers. And they also found out that they are pretty bad in math that yeah. <laughs> they can do very simple simple maths but but uh, but otherwise their maths abilities were were pretty poor but but in general the i mean the the conclusion from those studies was exactly that these characters seem to be autonomous and and that they gave this impression that they are also independently conscious uh, but of course i wouldn't you can yeah. give that impression. I mean, we know, of course, we, we have our yeah. 
series and alexas and all these other things that also give us the impression that they are independently conscious so i mean of course we can and the brain can also create simulations that are that are so complex simulations of of human behavior so they are basically like avatars avatars in 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 the brain these dream characters that they can create the impression that they are independently conscious but that doesn't of course mean that they actually are i mean they are just clever simulations that are not under our control uh so so i wouldn't i wouldn't say that they are independently conscious but that they are they are very complicated simulations and why do we have them is because one of the functions of dreaming is to simulate uh, the social world and and also to to practice social interactions social bonding uh, also so called mind reading that yes. when the dream characters behave in surprising ways we can and we do wonder in the dream so what are they up to what, 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 how should i interpret this social situation so we are practicing this very high level social cognitive skill of mind reading when we try to figure out what are the what yeah. are the beliefs and desires and plans and and uh, aims of of the other characters around us i mean that's a very important skill uh, uh, in in human social cognition and obviously we are doing that also in our dreams so so i i think that it's just a very clever stimulation and and very fascinating and and now i've also been thinking that the, i mean our brain has these capacities to generate simulations that are not under our control even though they appear in our consciousness and therefore it's maybe not also so surprising that we have for example disorders where people experience that they have a voice in their head that somebody is speaking to them but of course in dreams there are lots of people speaking yeah. to us and they are not me but it's still something my brain is doing so the brain really has this capacity to create credible credible uh, characters that that can appear like other conscious beings and uh, and totally appear separate from us and autonomous from us yeah it is uh, several uh, very interesting things here so i think one impression that i get is uh, from your work and research uh, that uh, dreaming is fundamental that there is some fundamental aspect to why we dream because it allows us to make sense of the world we are building uh, these rich simulations that are helping us probably uh, in our uh, wake cycles you also in your work you use the term offline dreaming online dreaming so and then in some of your work i also auntie have heard where you say well these lucid dreamers uh, if things are preplanned they can interact with through you know eye movement or some other clues with uh, people in the real world who are watching them and who are not dreaming uh, but somehow there can be some primitive communication going on uh, leading to all kind of possibilities down the road of uh, how uh, these dream states where you can extend the scope of communication not just with internal dream characters but you are telling through some mechanism uh people who are awake and they are just observing you and say well this is what is going on or if they say something you are able to take it in your dream state and take it to your dream characters so maybe we go there now a little bit and you talk about this you know dreaming as fundamental mechanism on this is the broader question that why do we dream but i think your answer is hey we are dreaming all the time that is fundamental to our existence but would love to hear more from you and then we can go into these distinctions that you make on online versus offline and uh, uh and this just broader communication mechanisms uh, okay yeah so so yeah when i have been theorizing about the connection between dreaming and consciousness what what first first i wanted to come up with a a definition that characterizes both of these concepts and, and this is the 
concept of world simulation or, or, or virtual reality in the brain. And then from, from that question, I went into theorizing about or asking the question, so why does the brain go through the trouble of constructing this highly complicated world simulation also during sleep? Because now, I mean, dreaming obviously requires metabolic energy being spent by the brain. I mean, we know that in REM sleep, the brain is highly active. Brain activity looks almost similar to wakefulness. So it's, it's burning a lot of metabolic energy to, to create this state of dreaming. I mean, we might expect that in order to spare, save energy, I mean, natural selection would have favored a brain that just shuts consciousness off completely during sleep when it's kind of not needed to navigate in the physical world so that we would have only totally dreamless, unconscious, non-conscious sleep and never experience anything during sleep. But we are in these colorful, strange adventures every night. And it seems to be something that is really biologically programmed for our brain to do. And not just our brain. I mean, it seems that, that dreaming probably happens in, in all mammals. So it's the mammalian brain that has similar stages of sleep, like REM sleep. And, and there is quite good evidence that, that, for example, cats and dogs also dream about events uh, that, that are simulating stuff that is interesting in, in, in their life. So I asked the question, so why does the brain generate these simulated worlds during sleep? And, and when I started to try to answer the question, and, and I looked at what kind of dream theories already exist, because I mean, there are so many different dream theories. And I realized that many of the theories are based often on quite anecdotal evidence that, that they haven't really looked at the evidence from dream data at large. I mean, really large samples of dreams that have been collected in, 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 with good methods and then look at the statistical properties of this data. Rather, they were based on kind of anecdotal evidence and also another perspective that was missing from many old or most old, old dream theories actually is the evolutionary perspective that if dreaming evolved with mammals or the mammalian brain and and it means that our ancestors i mean primates ancestral humans they must have been dreaming for hundreds of thousands of years for millions of years in a totally different environment than our current environment so dreaming must have been solving some problems helping helping uh, uh, in, in some way having some kind of benefit that was selected for already in, in that kind of environment for, for that kind of life. And the, and the first thing that I paid attention to when I started to really read about like, like dream, uh, uh, the, the, the large amount of dream research and its results was that there seemed, seemed to be a conspicuous, what I now call negativity bias in dream contents. That we have these categories of dreams that we call nightmares. We have bad dreams. Then we have recurrent dreams. We have post-traumatic dreams. And, and uh, then we know that, that uh, Many people are quite sensitive, for example, to if they watch horror movies, yeah. they will, I mean, they, some people say that they can't watch horror movies because then they will have terrible nightmares about, about that. And, and yeah, people who have undergone traumatic experiences, I mean, some victims of, of crime or nat natural catastrophes, terrorist attacks, you know, living in war zones and so forth, almost inevitably they will have nightmares about those horrific events that they went through. Although otherwise dreaming is very difficult to actually influence. I mean, you can't program your own dreams. 
no, no matter what you want to dream about, yeah. it's, I mean, very difficult to manipulate your, your dreams. But if you undergo a horrible, life-threatening, traumatic experience, it's quite likely that you will actually have dreams about it. And sometimes they, I mean, you can't get rid of that such dreams. So that we know that people, for example, who have studied, who, who were going through the horrors of Second World War, they were having nightmares about it 50 years after the war. So those dreams are the most, in a way, most intense, most powerful, most persistent types of dreams. And then I thought, here is something special. I mean, if dreaming has a function, then maybe it has something to do with this negativity bias that is showing up in a lot of the dream data. And, and also we know that if we look at universal dreams, so dreams that all over the world, independent of cultures and populations and age and, and all those kinds of things appear in, in the data, that they also tend to be highly negative and, and, and the same themes come up like the most universal theme is being chased or attacked by some kind of enemy. Often they are male strangers or wild animals or monsters that, that, that are aggressively attacking you. I mean, personally, you, you are in the, again, like in the center of the dream world, and then you have to deal with an aggressive attack from these kinds of enemies. Other very common themes are, are being getting lost or trapped, uh, some property being lost, or, or your house being demolished or, or some catastrophe happening and, and uh, you are being late from, from some important event or you are missing your bus or your flight yeah. or students dream about uh, suddenly being in an exam and they figure out that they are, they are unprepared and the questions are impossible. Or, or you are operating some machine or driving a car or trying to make an important phone call and, and the things don't work out as you would like. So all these sorts of themes are very highly universal across the world in different populations. Yeah. And they are also showing this negativity bias. And, and then when I started to put these things together, I asked myself, so what do we use? I mean, we, we have pretty sophisticated simulators. So what are the, what are the best, best uh, simulations and simulators that we use? And, and I would say they are probably flight simulators that are being used to train pilots to really like, like pilot these like giant planes. I mean, I mean the, the passenger planes and, and they are very highly realistic. And why do we force pilots to actually train in the simulators regularly? Is because there you can train all kinds of surprising, more or less dangerous and risky situations and, and how to deal with them in a totally safe place. I mean, nobody's yeah. in danger. You are not in danger. Passengers are not in danger. The plane is in no danger. And yet you get the same kind of experience that you, you are under time pressure to make the right selections, to recognize a threat. I mean, you need to recognize, hey, this meter is showing that there is this uh, uh, red light. So should I respond and what does it mean? And so you need to recognize a threat and then you need to quite quickly decide what is the cor correct pr procedure? How, how do you act in this? And when, when you do something, then the plane responds and then you need to make the next decision and so forth. And then I, I came to, to think that, well, maybe this is exactly what the brain is doing when it, with this negativity bias. It's throwing towards us surprising, dangerous events that we need to recognize. Hey, here is something fishy going on. What is that guy following? Why is that guy following me? Is there a wolf in the, in the bushes or... or, or, or uh, uh, is, is there a, a terrible like hurricane coming? The, the sky looks ominous and, and, and stuff like that that we have, have in, in 
in the beginning of, of a nightmare, for example, that, that things start, start to go wrong at some point. And, and then we need to recognize what is the threat and we need to decide what to do. So should I run away or should I call for help or should I hide behind under the stairs or, or somewhere? And, and, uh, and these are very like, you could say primitive uh, strategies of threat avoidance that would have been useful already, already in the ancestral evolutionary environment. I mean, there were all kinds of threats from the natural environment, and it would have been useful to, to get prepared for all those kinds of threats. And therefore, so, so my, what I call the threat simulation theory of the function of dreaming, what it basically says is that when we when we dream, what actually happens is an automatically biologically programmed, well, you could call it a flight simulator, fight or flight simulator, threat simulator. We step inside that and then we are thrown into surprising threatening events and they are realistic and they are actually more realistic than the flight simulators for the pilots. The pilots do not lose their memory. So they know they are in a simulator. Oh. They, they know they are not in any danger. When we step in a dream simulation, we have no idea it's not really happening. We think we are going to die or we are going to really, I mean, we are really in this danger because we can't remember and we can't test, question the reality of the simulation. And, and therefore we take it very seriously. And it's funny, like, like, I mean, I know from my own experience and, and from many reports that I have, dream reports that I've collected, that when people who suffer from like recurrent nightmares, for example, when the nightmare starts, it's quite common to think that, oh no, this horrible thing, I, I remember I have dreamt about it and now it's really happening, what I'm going to do. So... So we, we might even remember that we previously dreamt about it, but now this time it's for real because it feels so very real. And then when yeah. we wake up, we realize, well, it was just another dream this time as well. So, so it's very realistic. And that, of course, is important. An important feature of the whole simulation is that we don't know it's a simulation so that we actually use exactly the same threat avoidance strategies that we would use in the real situation, that we really believe that our lives are in danger and now we need to act quickly and we need to act efficiently and we need to use all our, like that we are highly motivated to, to escape or fight or whatever we decide to do against the threat. Yeah. Because it, if we were lucid all the time, if we knew, okay, this is a dream, oh, what is that monster? I will go and punch it into, in, in, in the nose because I'm in no danger. So, so you could just like play around with, with everything in, in your dream, if you knew that it is a dream. But that's, that's the idea of the threat simulation theory that tries to explain these negative, negative dreams, all kinds of negative dreams that they are actually threat simulations that, that help us to prepare for potential future threats. And, and they are based on or both on kind of our evolutionary history that we have these quite primitive kinds of threats like a monster or wild animal or a storm occurring and coming after us in the dream or quite modern kinds of threats as well, like, like the exam or, or missing your flight or, 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 or things like that. So, so, so uh, it's quite flexible and creative in adapting many different kinds of threats, whatever seems to be relevant for our like a current situation based on what we have experienced in the past. Do you think, Auntie, that in the research, is there an indication, are we making new memories in different dream states or we are not making any new memories? Well, it looks like, at least it's not really the purpose of dreaming or dreams to, to be remembered explicitly. Yeah. And there may be also good reasons for that because because like I said, dreaming is something that, that is, is in common with the mammalian brain. And it would be actually quite counterproductive if 
we cannot make the difference between what happened yeah. in the dream and what happens in reality. Uh, uh, also for, 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 the, for animals, it would be, I mean, they would not be able to, you know, critically think about, okay, was that only a dream or did I, is there really yeah. this enemy behind that bush? So it's important also that when we have practiced these practice sessions inside the dream simulator, that we don't actually remember that or think yeah. that this really happened. As you, say, uh, as, as you say that they are in the dreaming, you sometimes call it offline. And there are many things that are offline, like we you know, can't move or that sort of thing, uh, which is that then makes it a safe space. Same way, uh, memory systems to be mostly offline would be of value because then we truly in this simulation, in this rich simulation, uh, we, you know, can prepare ourselves for all different types of eventualities and things that the real life might throw at us, but uh, not act on it during dream, you know, physically or remember it. So that way, then when we come out of it, uh, you know, in our online state, uh, then we can just, you know, somehow use some of that learning or whatever. Uh, uh, because, but if we have, to your point, very vivid memories, then it would be very difficult to differentiate uh, was, is it, was it a dream memory or was it you know, a real life memory? So I totally, totally see, your, see your point on that. Yeah, so, so it's, I mean, I mean, we know that, that if you confuse reality with, with your like imagination, then, then you are going to not be very functional in the real world. But of course, we could also argue that maybe maybe some of the threat simulations, I mean, if you do remember them, they might be also some kind of cues about potential future threats. So, so it might not only be counterproductive to, to remember them, but if you remember them, you should be able to still realize that it didn't happen in reality. Because, I mean, if, if something terrible happens and, and, and you have... I mean, I mean, somebody does something bad to you in the dream, and then you start to take that person responsible for that in real life. I mean, that that wouldn't be very healthy. There is actually uh, there were some studies that that were studying dreams, where, if I remember correctly, it was so that if if the uh, girlfriend had had a dream about his boyfriend being unfaithful in the dream that sometimes this carried over that that they were angry in the waking life for for that kind of behavior uh, uh, because it i mean this kind of feeling of jealousy can can be so intense in the dream that it can even carry over to real life and then of course it's important to to make the distinction what happened in the dream and what is going on in, in, the, in the real life that you don't start to confuse that. So, so there may be, I mean, I would say, especially for animals, it would be important because they can't make these distinctions that they don't remember it. I'm not entirely sure, does it help us sometimes if we remember our bad dreams to avoid the same situations or, or making the same mistakes during wakefulness. There's one interesting study that was carried out in France uh, with students were preparing for a very important entrance exam to the medical school, a very, very difficult exam. And, and uh, they studied, do they dream about that exam before it happens? And it turned out that those students who did dream about it and in a threatening manner that they dreamt about that, that uh, they hadn't studied properly or they missed missed the bus or they were late to the exam or something went wrong, they actually got better results in the exam. So it may be that also remembering what could go wrong might make you more careful in not making those mistakes in real life as well. So, so the threat simulation might work also somehow, somehow uh, beneficially if you do remember it. Yeah. But, but yeah. I don't think it's, it's necessary, at least during, I mean, evolutionary history. I, I think 
most of these kinds of quite primitive threats of recognizing an enemy yeah. and then escaping or fighting or running away. I mean, this, this you don't need to remember it. It's maybe better yeah. you don't remember it. But when it happens in real life, your consciousness probably goes into this kind of intense state of recognizing the threat and immediately being able to choose a strategy uh, of, of how to avoid the threat. And it's also interesting that people who witness some horrible, surprising catastrophe happening, I mean, like a terrorist attack or some natural catastrophe, uh, tsunami or something occurring, very often people report yeah. that they, when they were watching it, they felt that this is not really happening. This must be a dream. And it might be that this is sort of an altered state of consciousness that allows us also to act more coolly and rationally in a, in a, in a situation where our lives are actually threatened, that, that we feel that, that, okay, this is happening now and I'm, I'm just acting, but actually it feels like not really happening. So, so it's, a, it's an interesting state of, of mind when we go into that state where we feel that our lives are threatened. So it might be again like that the dream state and, and the waking consciousness state are not so far away from each other in these kinds of life-threatening situations. It feels like definitely, uh, Auntie, that uh, uh, dreaming, it, it's a big feature of our existence and it's not a bug and it has this evolutionary advantage, this adaptive response kind of advantage. It looks like attached to that. Um, uh, it's, it's clear to me uh, that it, it is such fundamental thing. It is also interesting to note that the my own dreams or dreams of other people, my loved ones around me or my friends, our dreaming content is very specific to us. It is very earthly. So it's not, you know, some Hollywood director, creativity, creating artificial words that have no resemblance to the actual world in which we live. So the contents are very specific uh, there is a context uh, to it. Uh, uh, there is some personalization and it's all very earthly. Uh, the brain is not uh, a Hollywood director trying to imagine life on a distant star. Uh, it is trying to do, to your point, if it is an evolutionary advantage and it is spending those precious calories in the context of evolutionary history, it is trying to do a useful thing to keep us alive because at the end of the day, if uh, the purpose of the brain as a control system is to keep us alive, then this has to play and fit to, uh, fit to that as well. So uh, it, all makes, it all makes wonderful sense uh, from that perspective. You, you're talking about uh, dream states and whatnot. I have a little uh, sort of a... a joke thing to share. So my wife would, you know, sometimes tell me in the morning, last night in my dreams, Amjad, you were not supportive. So this, you were talking about the girlfriend thing and, you know, and that sort of thing. It's here, you, you know, don't support me in my dreams. And I, uh, you know, uh, I say, well, one of these days, maybe somebody would invent something and we would be able to go experience the dreams and whatnot and uh yeah so uh it it is that was interesting that you brought up as we bring our conversation on to toward closure what are some in your mind when it comes to the dreaming and consciousness what are some big open questions uh, research challenges what would, if you were to, sir, set the research agenda for the next 10 years, uh, what sort of things you would say to your own sort of research community that you work with your collaborators or people in the community at large uh, would love to hear? What are some important, meaningful questions and uh, where should research effort and 
uh, funds to go toward in this field? Yeah, so, so uh, I mean, the, the field has been growing hugely it during is. the last like, 20 years. It is. Uh, and I, I think what is maybe, maybe a little bit left behind is exactly this approach that we need to take the, the phenomenology of consciousness very seriously. And that's why, that's one reason why I always wanted to emphasize dreaming as a, as a topic of research, because when you study dreaming and dreams, then you are almost by definition, you are studying the, the conscious subjective experiences yeah. themselves. Yeah. And, and what I was always interested in is that, okay, so, so if we are going to have a sort of grand unified theory of consciousness, I mean, that is supposed to explain the relationship between consciousness and the brain, then that theory should also be able to predict and explain how dreams are generated in the brain in general, and maybe all also like, like predict why certain contents of dreaming are more common than other contents of dreaming. And, and I would emphasize I, in the future as well that, that we need to really pay attention to consciousness itself. I mean, the, the subjective experiences, they need to be mapped out very carefully before we run into looking at the neural correlates and neural mechanisms. Because if we don't have a clear understanding of what the phenomenon itself is like, we don't really know how to interpret the neural correlates and the neural mechanisms. So we need to approach consciousness from both sides so that we try to build up. I mean, by looking at the neural mechanisms in the brain, we try to build up from those towards conscious experiences. Do we recognize something there that could explain the, the like I said, the, the temporal dynamics and the, the, the spatial organization of what we experience? And on the other hand, we need to describe consciousness itself, for example, like dream experiences, so much in detail that we could start to understand. So, okay, so, so what kind of brain mechanisms are now directly underneath this experience? How is it possible to experience, for example, a certain kind of a dream world with, with these characters, autonomous characters, simulations of, of other people and, 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 and events and the unity of consciousness. I mean, because we always experience that I am one person inside, immersed inside one world. Yeah. So there is this fundamental unity to consciousness. And that's also part of, like you mentioned, that I believe that the self, I mean, the way we experience ourselves in the first person perspective and, and the body in the center of that world, that that is just part of the same overall system, that we have these patterns of yeah. qualia, basically, and they are very highly organized so that we can experience this, this colorful rich world and our body and our self and our position in this world is just one pattern of phenomenology or, or qualia inside that world. So we need to map this phenomenology of consciousness very carefully so that we could start from that side as well and try to figure out to what in the brain could be somehow isomorphic to all this complex experience. And, and now one uh, problem, I mean, that is both the problem of consciousness and the problem of the unity is that now when we look at like single like qualia or single perceptual contents like when you see a color or when you see a face they are totally different parts of the visual cortex for example which which seem to be involved yeah so how is it possible that when we experience consciousness and now i see your face well they're only on the screen but i see your face but I also see my laptop. I also see the room surrounding it. I feel that I am myself here in the same space. All this is unified into one world. And yet when we look at the brain activities, there is 
like like this fusiform face area is active when I look at your face, and then some other part is active to 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 the colors that I see and so forth. So where does the unity? Where is the unity of consciousness being generated? Uh, so so that is uh, I, I think so. Is there anti on that one? I I know that it's an open research question, but are there some good current theories? Like as you say that we experience consciousness as this wonderfully integrated, stable thing. Uh, and it has a lot of parts and it, you know, but we do our experience is all in its totality and, and, and richness. We are not experiencing parts. We are experiencing the whole thing. Are there current any theories or proposals on the table that which part going to your neural correlates of consciousness, that which part of the brain is doing this wonderful integration, which I know as an engineer, that when you even try to build a television or something like that, how difficult that is to create an integrated experience. And even there, maintaining stability is difficult and things will flicker and they will go out of sync. And here, for the most part, you know, uh, uh, unless, you know, uh, something bad happens, uh, an accident or whatever, for the most part, there is this wonderful, rich, integrated experience. Uh, to your point that, you know, while we can reflect upon some individual parts of an experience, you know, you know, as you said, you know, a, a color or something else or a face or some other thing, but when we are just going about our day-to-day -day life, it is just so phenomenal, so amazing that somehow this integration of this experience and its stability and it feels so rich and real. How are we, you know, any proposals on how, which part of the brain is correlated with generating that integrating all senses and everything and higher order and context into what we call experience? Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. I mean, there are several theories and the problem is that they do not really agree about the, the mechanism or, or the location. So for example, Tononi's information integration theory, that's more at the level of, of like, like an information theory, but it is connected to this uh, posterior hot zone idea that it's, it's mostly in the posterior cortex. But then on the other hand, there is this uh, global neural workspace theory, which mostly says that it's the frontal, frontal parietal areas that have this global workspace that, that is the mechanism of consciousness. Then there is the old Rudolf Linas theory, which is the thalamocortical loop theory, which says that it's, it's the loops between the thalamus and cortex, which, which uh, uh, both create the context of the, of the spatial unity and then kind of uh, uh, embeds the, the single uh, representations or simulations of, of single objects into that. So we have several theories and now the, the problem is how do we test those theories against each other so that we can make scientific progress. So of course it's good that we have many theories but it's not good if we don't have particular hypotheses that can distinguish between which theory is actually on the right track and which one is not, but but I I do agree that this may be the core of, of like also future investigations into consciousness is is exactly to explain this unity because it is really almost mysterious that even if you just look at one single object, it has color, it has shape, maybe it's moving around, and it also always is presented as a single package of information. Yeah. where all these features are together. And the same happens in dreams. And yet we have different parts of the cortex processing each of these features. And then the object is not floating alone in an empty space, but it's in this context of the whole complex world of, of, of other objects, multisensory objects, like, like there is auditory information bound together with visual information and bodily information and, and all this super complex. So, so I, I think uh, we need to really understand how this unity is brought about. 
before we can explain how consciousness itself is being brought about because we can't really ever uh, experience just like a single qualia and nothing else yeah. I, mean, I mean we don't have that kind of experiences so somehow the unity is is already there like like a given before consciousness is even even possible and and i i think that is that is a key question that that what is the the, the mechanism in the brain that brings about this fundamental unity in which all these qualia basically appear as bound together into this one unified world of experience, both during wakefulness and, and during dream. So th this one person asked a question and maybe that's a good place to uh, bring our today's fascinating conversation to close here. And the question is that, hey, uh, auntie, you talk about uh, uh, online dreaming, offline dreaming. Uh, is it possible that when we are in our online sort of wakefulness state and uh, our experiences, dreaming experiences, if it is a big dream, all modulated by our external environment? So this person is using this analogy and asking a question, is that offline dreaming state that generative state, which we have no control over whenever we enter it, is going on all the time in parallel somewhere unconsciously, even when we are awake and, and in this world and having this experience and we are not in that dream state uh, anymore, that is it still going on somewhere? And it is just that when we uh, sleep, then somehow since we are sort of, you know, offline now and disconnected from that outside world uh, that somehow we then slip into that offline world. But is the offline world going on all the time uh, unbeknownst to us? And it is just that uh, sometime during our REM sort of state, we find ourselves slipping into that thing. Uh, so that is what this person's question is so um, okay. I just... okay okay yeah interesting question well the way i see it is that there is not like a, like a separate offline world that that could exist uh somehow independently of of the of the online world because there is just one world simulation mechanism yeah and and parts of it I mean, it, there can be even a mixed world. And this is what we see in various uh, sleep disorders that, uh, for example, people who suffer from night terrors or sleepwalking, they, they can open their eyes and their brain is still partly in a sleep state. And they can somehow perceive the real environment. So, so the real environment is modulating there's their world simulation, but then they also see things there that are coming from the dream simulation. So they can see, I mean, often like in, like in uh, these night terrors, the person has their eyes open, they, they see some other room or whatever, and then they see some horrible snakes or spiders or, or some weird guy standing in the corner of their bedroom. And these are, hallucinations i mean they come from the dream world but they are all integrated so you can have part of your world that you experience part of it can be modulated by the senses and part of it is is simulated by the brain and they all become like one world that you experience and it's not possible for the person who experiences it to to realize that which parts are coming from external sources and which are coming from internal sources it's just one reality that is totally real for that person and and therefore there cannot be an on offline world existing somewhere else while the online world exists because there's just one world simulation system in the brain yeah. and it just uses different sources of information but sometimes the sources can also get mixed up and then you partly see the real world or, or information modulates mm -hmm. modulates that world and partly the internal world 
modulates it and then you get a nice mix up and 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 uh, hallucinations that you take for real as, as if they would exist in the real world so so there is not an offline world existing while we are online and, and perceiving during wakefulness our I mean kind of surrounding world Uh, maybe, Auntie, this is a good time to, for you to just tell the viewers a little bit about uh, your uh, own research, uh, you, the university and the program, your own research program, and just a little bit about, and if somebody wants to connect with you, uh, what kind of uh, collaborations or partnerships, if any, that you are uh, looking for or could be potentially interested so maybe we spend a few minutes on uh, giving our viewers some ideas about where uh, your university, your lab, uh, your, your own research and things that you are working on and then any uh, collaborations, uh, partnerships, funding, investments uh, that you are seeking. Right. So um, <clears throat> me and my group, so, so we have basically three different lines of research that, that all deal with consciousness. And, and one of them is this kind of quite philosophical and theoretical where I try to figure out these different theories of consciousness and, and, uh, and, and also build more on this biological perspective uh, because there are many other types of philosophical theories as well. Then the, the second line of research is the neural correlates of visual consciousness. So there what we try to figure out is what exactly is going on in the brain when a visual stimulus that we present somewhere, when does it exactly enter consciousness? I mean, I mean there is a lot of information processing and neural activity along the way. And now we have tried to measure, especially with EEG, what happens and when does it happen when the information first becomes available for conscious experiences. So, so that's a long line of research that we have been doing with my colleagues for a long time. And now uh, recently we, we started to also uh, go more into multi-sensory correlates. So, so I mean, exactly trying to deal with this problem of unity because of course we see visual objects but the visual objects can, can at the same time be an auditory object. So if you think about a, a fly or a bee flying around or the bird, and they are emanating sounds at the same time. And again, we perceive one object that is a visual object and, and an auditory object. So, so uh, where does this visual and auditory consciousness come together, so to speak? Uh, so, so that's where we are going with, with that at the moment. And then the third line of research has been these altered states of consciousness. And I mean, I was talking at length already my research on dreaming yeah other related research has been on on the neural mechanisms of general anesthesia so so we had have had a, a big project in collaboration with with anesthesiologists especially harry shanin's group where we have also compared like a normal physiological dreaming and sleep with, with this artificial sleep that is induced by anesthetic drugs and, and whether the brain goes into a similar state in, in general anesthesia. And one surprising finding uh, that, that we have recently published is that actually people who are under general anesthesia and have become unresponsive. It means that, I mean, you ask them to like open your eyes or squeeze my hand and they no longer do it. So they are unresponsive under the general anesthetic if we then let them wake up from that and we ask, just like in dream research, we ask, so what was going on through your mind? They actually report, very often they report dreamlike experiences. So it appears that general anesthesia disconnects consciousness rather than totally somehow makes it disappear. So general anesthesia is not necessarily a total, totally unconscious state. It can also be a dreamlike state. So, so, so this has been an one line of. It could be maybe research. another another altered state of another altered state of consciousness where you are dissociative or dissociated from 
you know this, but you 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 are having some other altered sort of uh, uh, altered sort of you know state experience. Exactly, exactly. So so then then I've been involved in some also hypnosis research, which also seems to be at least for some people like like a like an altered state of uh, of consciousness and and uh, it's also interesting to compare different altered states of consciousness and i think what we would actually need is a sort of a general theory of all different altered states of consciousness so that we could uh, put into the same framework like dreaming lucid dreaming general anesthesia hypnosis and and what is now uh, coming like 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 a very new popular area but i'm not personally involved in that is is a, a psychedelic science so, so yeah so there is a lot of new research on the altered state of consciousness uh, generated by by psychedelic psychedelics so what kind of states can they uh, uh, generate how closely related are those for example to to dream experiences and how they are related to to mystical experiences and religious experiences because those yeah. are also very fascinating types of experience so so i i mean my interests are very broad in in this field and and therefore i'm i'm interested in almost everything that has to do with consciousness but but mostly my interest has been in these in these uh, altered states and yeah one thing i didn't maybe mention so clearly yet is uh, this other theory of the function of dreaming. I, I did talk about this threat simulation theory, which explains these highly negative dreams, but we also have highly positive dreams. And, and, and these positive dreams often have to do with, with these, you know, other dream characters, social interactions. I mean, we dream about romantic partners and, 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 uh, and our crushes and, and, and maybe celebrities and, and old schoolmates. And we, we have adventures with our friends and, and things like that. And uh, we have proposed with my colleagues that, that these social simulations also have functions that, that we practice social bonding, social interaction, maybe even something like mate selection when we have these romantic uh, 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 dreams about very desirable partners. Uh, so, so we are currently carrying out more research in in uh, in the nature of different dream characters. So, sort of avatars, avatars in the brain, avatars in our dreams. What kind of simulations are there, and who are we actually meeting in our dreams, and what kind of relations do we have with them? Like how positive or neutral or negative are they? And, and do they perhaps so serve some functions of strengthening our social bonding or maybe keeping up our social bonds if we are isolated from, uh, from meeting them, the people in real life? And, and we have been also collecting new dream data during the COVID pandemic because the COVID pandemic, I mean, as horrible as it is, it's also a sort of natural experiment because it's a huge oh. threat. So it's a threat stimulus, stimulus. So we should be, I mean, our dream mechanisms should probably be generating nightmares and bad dreams about the threatening aspects of, of the COVID pandemic. But it also has generated a lot of social isolation in lockdowns. So it's also interesting to see whether the social simulations in our dreams somehow, how do they reflect or respond to social isolation? That, that it seems that our dreams are very persistent in keeping up the social simulation. So that even if, I mean, even if you are in lockdown, you lock yourself up for one month and you only, you know, order foods, to your doorstep, you are in total isolation. You you don't meet anybody. You still meet your friends and your colleagues and your partners every night in your dreams. They yeah. are being simulated. They don't disappear. So, in a way, in a way, it's it's 
you are not socially isolated because you are still surrounded by simulated yeah. avatars of your friends and, and loved ones and family members every night in your dreams. And, and now we are trying to figure out figure out what kind of functions this has and, and how is it modulated by these different uh, external social conditions. I mean, do you really meet anybody in, in your real life? How does that, how does your dreaming simulation respond to that? So, so these sorts of things. So, so looking more into, into these social simulations in dreams is, is one line of research. So, so, uh, it's phenomenal. All of it these, looks like, uh, it looks like you guys are having a lot of fun. Oh yes, it's it's fascinating because I think it it goes back to I sometimes think that it really goes back to this why I first became interested in in consciousness and dreaming. I mean these experiences that you sort of wake up in your dream world and you look around and you wonder what is this place? What is this dream? Am I dreaming? Is this a real place? And, and when you meet people there, I mean, when you are lucid or semi-lucid and you wonder, are those people real or are they just characters in my dream? And, and in a way, it's fascinating that you can actually do research on, on this, this uh, alternative reality. I mean, I, I, I feel like an explorer that can go to an alternative reality and try to figure out what's really going on in there. And, and where is this world? Where is this place? And how does the brain generate it if it is a simulated world? And if it is not a simulated world in the brain, what the heck is it then? I mean, I mean, then, then it's a real mystery. And uh, of course, like ancient cultures believed that when we dream, what actually happens is that during sleep, your body becomes immobile, almost like, like dead, and your soul escapes your body and it flies into this alternative spirit world, yeah. the netherworld or the underworld or whatever it was believed to be. And then it meets there with your ancestors and maybe with gods and gets messages from the future. And then you come back with, with that, kind of, that kind of information. So... So it's fascinating that when, uh, I mean, uh, dreaming was believed to be a real concrete alternative reality in many cultures before. And now we think that it's also an alternative reality, but it's actually a simulated world inside the brain. And you can still enter this alternative reality and have ad adventures there. And we still cannot really explain scientifically what exactly this place is but I, I think we are at least quite sure it's not an alternative spirit world where we where yeah. we go during during our dreams no i love it i love it auntie sir thank you for being so so generous with your time i uh, as you can see i'm having real fun i am so hopeful that we'll be talking again as well but this has been just awesome thank you for uh, being you know, sharing all these wonderful insights with us. Thank you for inviting me. I mean, as you can see, I'm also enthusiastic about speaking about all these things and I could probably go on endlessly, but, but it's good that, that we have reached some kind of conclusions. Otherwise I would, I would just go on until we drop off. So thank you very much. I really enjoyed talking, talking to you about my favorite topics. <laughs>